So, sitting now in my uh, chair of panel position, let, I have the great pleasure to introduce uh, the first of our speakers, um, Professor Christine Degg, who's Professor of Philosophy and Director of the Post-Humanism Research Institute and Post-Humanism Research Network at uh, Brock University in Ontario, Canada. And she will be talking to us about our becoming post-human, the delight of material entanglement. Thank you. Um, and before I start, um, I'm sure this will be coming, but I wanted to express my personal thanks to the steering committee and the organization committee and all the staff who have done an incredible work running this conference. Um, thank you so much. I think we, we should clap them. Like, thank you. Thank you. So I'll just go to my paper. Um, critical post-humanists call for a new ontology and a shift in our thinking about who and what we are and how we exist with the multitude of others with whom we are always related in order to move us away from harmful humanist ontologies. A post-humanist material feminist philosophy allows us to challenge the anthropocentric point of view by rejecting human exceptionalism and emphasizing the material embeddedness and interconnectivity of all beings. Conceptualized as a mangle, a biocultural creature, an exposed subject, or a transjective being, the posthuman is still in the process of becoming. The becoming posthuman that I gesture to is a matter of acknowledging and embracing our being as posthuman, as the radically entangled and interconnected being we are and always have been, one that emerges from a manifold of affects, tensions, and relations and is constructed by them. The fundamental vulnerability this generates can be generative of a new type of ethos and ethical responsibility one that may lead to the enhanced flourishing of life in all its instances. Beyond accepting and embracing our entanglement, we must actively work toward affirming and taking delight in it. What is at stake here is, the, is building the foundation for a radically material understanding of our post-human entanglement upon which we can elaborate ethical and political modes of thinking that foster our thriving and the unfolding of life in the mode of delight. I propose that we are transjective beings. That is, we are always both transsubjective and transobjective. We are always caught up in a field of tensions and forces, being done and undone, both by ourselves and by other beings we are entangled with, doing and undoing them as well, both subjectively and materially. This resonates with Rosie Bredotti's proposal to conceive of the embrainment of the body and the embodiment of the mind. We are assemblages of experiences, consciousness, materiality, and so forth, and we exist in a flat ontological plane in which human exceptionalism is rejected and agency, or rather agentic capacity, is attributed to all beings. I form my concept by appealing to notions of radical material entanglement to be found in the works of Jane Bennett, Stacia Lamo, and Samantha Frost, among others. It is common uh, among post humanist thinkers to posit a flat ontological plane in which no being takes precedence over others. Rosie Bredotti coins this Zoe egalitarianism, a position that embraces and values all life and rejects any form of exceptionalism. Embracing this necessitates the shift initiated by the post-human condition, quote, uh, a qualitative shift in our thinking about what exactly is the basic unit of common reference for our species, our polity, and our relationship to the other inhabitants of this planet, end quote. Understanding our being as rooted and entangled in materiality is key to this shift and is the first step toward embracing our beings as such, as I will argue in the latter part of this paper. There is no time to go into the details, but I want to walk you through some key concepts I use from contemporary thinkers. Bennett's concept of vibrant matter is one of those. 
I, um, it posits that all matter is lively and that agency is distributed among the material. For her, quote, all bodies are kin in the sense of inextricably enmeshed in a dense network of relations. Grounding her view in Spinoza's notion of the affective body and Deleuze and Guattari's notion of assemblage, she speaks of an effervescence of agency that is distributed within and across individuals in the assemblage. This leads to a displacement of the subject, a deflation of the notion of agent, and a redus rediscovery of what we always were, beings engaged in a dance with other beings, human and non-human, and an interfolding network of humanity and non-humanity, as she puts it. An important point she makes is that the human individual, or more, more properly the individual, is itself an assemblage that operates within congreg congregational assemblages. Entanglement is multi-layered and runs within and through the layers. Stacia Lemos' transcorporeal being partakes in this, since, as she says, the, and that's my favorite quote from her, um, the human is always the very stuff of the messy, contingent, emergent mix of the material world. Our bodies have perme permeable boundaries, the skin, mucous surfaces, orifices, and those make us porous beings speared by the materiality surrounding us at the same time that we seep into that materiality. The human being as material is, as she says, subject to the agencies of the compromised, entangled world. This all means that we are toxic bodies with exceedingly leaky borders, and as such, we are post-humanist, indeed, the humanist subject is a solid, autarkic entity that does not leak or is not permeated by other beings. This points to the ontological vulnerability which is the fabric of our beings, a vulnerability that can be problematic in a humanist context, wherein we try to deny it or guard ourselves against it. It can, however, be the tool we need to thrive as post-humans. Acknowledging the material entanglement of beings, we must also abandon our humanist understanding of agency as the willful expression of freedom by an autarkic and autonomous being. We must instead embrace a notion of distributed ag agentic capacity, a concept that is used by Diana Cole, Samantha Frost, and many others. To say that all matter and material beings have agentic capacity allows for capturing the way in which we are done and undone by our material entanglements and serves to further undermine the fantasy of human mastery and exception. Both a forest fire or a microbe have a genetic capacity and oftentimes the extent of their agency far surfaces that of the human. This agentic capacity is further complicated if we look into biochemical processes. Samantha Frost demonstrates that these pro processes have intentless direction. This, she says, allows us to account for the precision and directedness of biological activity without that activity being reducible to anything at all. Indeed, once one looks into the atomic field, one discovers the strict mechanics governing energy relations between particles. She tracks this through the atom, molecules, various types of chemical bondings, the operations of uh, permeable membranes, and the role proteins and oxygen play, and she insists that these processes are distributed throughout all matter, including, of course, the matter composing us. As she puts it, the organism is permeated by its habitat and relies on the traffic of atoms and cells through its numerous membranes for its persistence, for life to unfold. This is one of the key to Frost's propositions. No traffic through membranes, no life. No intermingling with one's habitat, no life. These processes are material, true and true. And this, gives, uh, this view gives a biochemical foundation to my concept of transjective being. 
We are permeated by the world we are in as much as we permeate it. And this renders us vulnerable ontologically. This ontological fact is not to be construed negatively. Understanding it and embracing it can be generative of a new type of ethical responsibility which may lead to enhanced flourishing of life in all its instances. The Latin vulner means to wound, and the usual meaning we attach to vulnerability is to be susceptible to physical or emotional injury, which assumes that the body is normally well-bounded and should remain so. This cannot apply to the transjective being. We need to take vulnerability in a different sense. The transjective being is vulnerable since it is a body that does and undoes what it interacts with. It has the ability to wound, yes, but mostly to affect. The Latin afficere would be more appropriate and to talk of affectability, a better way to describe what actually goes on. Being entangled in that effective fabric, our being is not only on the giving end of wounding, but on its receiving end as well. To wound is to affect. To quote Bennett again, quote, in a, not in a knotted world of vibrant matter, to harm one section of the web may very well be to harm oneself. But further, I would add, to be harmed is also to harm. We are not self-contained entities interacting with one another. It should also be understood that ability here does not point to any kind of strong, willful, autonomous agency. To refer back to Frost, this ability is mostly an intentless one, the effect of biochemical processes without direction. This makes us true and true, vulnerable as affect able. Oh, I forgot to skip that, okay. Vulnerability is something we have most often sought to guard ourselves against. However, as Simon Drichel puts it, quote, in seeking to defend ourselves, we, perversely, come to violate ourselves. Or to put this differently, what we preserve in self-preservation is what makes the self inhuman rather than human. In an effort to protect ourselves and become invulnerable, we do violence of our, to ourselves and dehumanize ourselves. It would be best to accept and embrace our vulnerability and seek a multitude of experiences. Claire Colebrook identifies the denial of our vulnerability, the forgetting of our impotentiality with humanistic thought. Indeed, a subject that's, that fantasizes about its own autonomy wishes to be potent rather than vulnerable. In Frames of War, Butler claims that the body as social phenomenon is vulnerable by definition. But the post-human transjective being presents itself as even more vulnerable than what Butler is offering because its permeability lays at its very biochemical core. A being whose persistence depends on transit through its own being and on its own transit through other beings. A being whose striving relies on its affecting and being affected by other beings, subjectively, socially, materially. Post-human vulnerability is something we ought to cherish and nourish. It is an ambiguous potentiality that we need to nurture. Providing a theorization of the human and all being as transjective and radically materially entangled moves us away from the centrality of a subject and its experiences, which has been the entire focus of the humanist tradition. It is a post-human move, literally a post-humanism. The focus on materiality and its radical entanglement is a further post-human move that allows us to understand how our vulnerability is constitutive of ourselves and other beings. It is the very foundation of life and what allows for life to persist. As such, it needs to be embraced, cherished, and fostered. The task is to recover ourselves as post-human. Alemo calls for the performance of exposure, namely embracing our permeability, and she explains that, quote, exposure entails the intuitive sense of the philosophical or the philosophical conviction that the impermeable Western human subject is no longer tenable. To occupy exposure as insurgent, vulnerability is to perform material rather than abstract alliances, she says. 
The exposed subject is always already penetrated by substances and forces that can never be properly accounted for. So what we need to do is actively seek what has been construed as our undoing in the humanist worldview, since only then will we be thriving as beings that are constantly and dynamically done and undone. The views I have discussed all take us back to Spinoza and his understanding of affective bodies as having the potential to affect and be affected. In her study of Spinoza, Asana Sharp explains that the politics of renaturalization depends on an accurate ontological understanding of ourselves and our active embrace of it. As she says, quote, only when we consider ourselves to be constituted by our constellations of relationships and community of affects can we hope to transform the forces that shape our actions and characters, end quote. And this includes the material entanglements of which we are. As she points out, there are multiple agencies at work, including what she refers to as impersonal politics, that, that which allows for the conscious and personal processes to unfold. Making ourselves aware of the existence and operation of these processes is key to not only a better understanding, but to an active embrace of a better ethos, a transjective ethics, one that immerses us in these processes rather than distinguish us from them. As she puts it, this requires an affective orientation toward joy, which indicates an augmentation in one's power or agency. It is only through such an orientation that we may take delight in our vulnerability and thrive ethically. The ethics we need is not a set of rules, but rather the embrace of an ethos, and the adoption of an orientation toward being, whereby one sees oneself as interconnected and one values life in its varied forms of intermingled striving. Acknowledging and nurturing our ontological vulnerability yields ethical growth by allowing the strive, this striving to unfold for all beings. To put it in Nietzschean terms, this means affirming life in all its instances, a sacred yes. Were we ever human in the humanist sense of the word? Have we not been post-human all along? This is a line of questioning put forward most recently by Claire Colebrook, for example. The idea is to claim, in the manner of Bruno Latour's We Have Never Been Modern, that we have never been human. The humanist ideals, autonomy, human exceptionalism, the rational human, the numerous dualisms, are merely concepts that have been superimposed on our reality, and we constantly fail to conform to them. Somewhat like Nietzsche's Christian who is doomed to sin because the ideal of Christian morality is unattainable. Living as humanists, we are necessarily alienated because we fail to embrace ourselves and life as they are. The becoming post-human that I gestured to, is, along with many other critical post-humanists, is precisely a matter of acknowledging and embracing our being as post-human, or perhaps as anti-human, as the human that we were before humanism laid its crushing ideals upon us. It is a matter of being authentic, maybe, about the entangled beings we are, rather than imagine ourselves to be the humans we can never be. Understanding our being as rooted and entangled in materiality is key to conceiving ourselves differently, and will yield an experience of our lives in the mode of delight, one that will foster our potential to affect and be affected, rather than suppress it. Thank you. Thank you very much, including for excellent timekeeping, which is, as, as a moderator, the most uh, eloquent compliment I could pay to you. Um, I was invited in my notes for moderators to do some kind of spiel between the, uh, the, uh, the lectures. I'll restrict it to just one question, maybe for you to keep in mind, and which might perhaps inspire uh, the audience also to uh, keep in mind the challenge. Um, one thing that struck me in your presentation was the extent to which um, statements about how things are um, sat cheek by jowl with statements about how things should be. And 
um, in particular the idea that it is embracing how things really are that uh, we can achieve something that is politically, ethically valuable is something that raises the very basic epistemological question why we should embrace how things are in the first place. There is one variant of humanism that is positivistic, that claims to represent things as they really are and make that a normative project. But there are other kinds of humanism that would actually embrace precisely the refusal to accept limitation to how things really are. How does that chime, conflict, harmonize, uh, or otherwise uh, dissonate with what you were saying? That's the question I'd like to leave hanging. Our second speaker, perhaps, is going to address precisely the same question, in which case that will be perfect, because it'll get a dialogue or at least a debate moving. Our second speaker is uh, Dr. Kem Shapiro, who is a professor, Kem Shapiro, who is Associate Professor of Politics and Government at Illinois State University, and who will be um, granting us the privilege of his thoughts on humanities for a post-human world language, images, and trees. Please. Thank you. Uh, I won't be addressing precisely the same question, but I will be addressing the question. I'm going to skip my abstract in the interest of time. Uh, in the age of the Anthropocene, uh, I do prefer the Capitalocene with more. Um, the uh, image of the human developed in modern European intellectual traditions has been criticized as a dangerous falsification of ecological interdependencies, even as the pernicious cause of environmental destruction. In turn, as rising oceans, burning forests, and collapsing fisheries ampl amplify militarized competitions amongst states, classes, corporations, and ethnic groups, they also drive a search for new modes of thought, representation, and social organization by which human beings seek to orient themselves to the biological and planetary infrastructure of their embodied lives. Under these pressures, the language of humanism has evolved. Witness, for example, the language of human capabilities or human security. Uh, now, my interest here instead is with a more radical and marginal set of thinkers, uh, perhaps some present, uh, who align a counter-racist, non-violent, and counter-nationalist ecological politics with the displacement of the idea of the human. Uh, for the sake of simplicity, I group these thinkers under the sign of post-humanism, though not also describe themselves. Uh, as its proponents, some already here, have explained, post-humanism re refers to the material entanglement, uh, or the material reality, rather, of ecological entanglement, which preceded and enabled both the human and humanism. Uh, sorry, it refers not <laughs> to that condition, uh, which in fact preceded both humanism uh, and the human, but rather to a perspectival orientation that represents and cognizes the human as an emergent relational hybrid or cyborg composition without essential form or purpose and in which agency is distributed. One could assemble many thinkers under the sign of post-humanism so understood. Here I'm focusing mainly on the works of Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari with a nod and perhaps apologies to Rosie Bradati. Um, uh, on their view, uh, discrete beings and individuals emerge from intercepting networks and processes or what they call durations, including the chemical, social, linguistic, climactic, geological, etc. Uh, they further suppose that ecological relations are always being assembled or uh, becoming, as they say, and shot through with more or less powerful tendencies to dis and reassemble or de and re-territorialize in other ways. Hence, as they put it, every object presupposes the continuity of a flow, every flow the fragmentation of the object. Uh, while their collaborative writings made little reference to pollution, deforestation, or climate change, uh, they've been seen by many as well-suited to an ecological politics, a connection made explicitly in Guattari's later writings. Uh, highlighting Gregory Bateson's influence, Robert Shaw writes, quote, Guattari explores how a failure to recognize that subjectivity emerges from its relationship with the earth threatens both earth and subjectivity. This emerges as an attempt to counter the increasingly precarious relationship between human, social, and environmental ecologies. It is an ecosophy which brings an ethico-political orientation of responsibility toward the earthed and worldly subjectivity, unquote. 
I take this as a fairly common uh, supposition and it's a fairly familiar way of expressing that supposition regarding the ethical and political implications of post-humanist thought more generally. More cautiously, uh, Jeffrey Nilon suggests that taking plant life as the ontological model understood in Deleuzean terms as a territorial rhizomatic assemblage rather than a set of individuated animal organisms will hopefully attune us better to ecological co-implications in what he calls our dark ecological times. He writes, quote, the animal territory for thematizing life focuses our attention on biopolitical bio competition among individuated organisms to the detriment of this robust sense of distributed interconnected life. Now, it's not far-fetched to suggest that the ideal of rational autonomy and faith in providential nature played a part in colonial destructions of indigenous peoples and ecosystems, nor that environmental ethics or politics might find affinities with a rhizomatic perspective, according to which social differences and political antagonisms emerge from complex biosocial ecologies subject to more or less abrupt transformation. However, if we adopt the view that human ideas and sensibilities are ecologically entangled, it follows that post-humanist philosophies are also entangled. That is, they do not more or less, or less adequately represent, but rather participate in and intersect with other ecological processes. As Dr. Brazzati put it earlier, they're embodied and embedded. Uh, but what is the nature, so to speak, of this participation? Uh, we have to avoid here, I think, the Hegelian conceit uh, that some take, uh, uh, seek, uh, by which they take a shortcut between ontology and politics, conceiving posthumanist philosophy simultaneously as of and for our time. That is, they suppose that contemporary configurations, or we might suppose, that contemporary configurations of human and non-human ecologies promulgate posthuman ecosophies, and therefore implicit, implicitly positioning our own thought as the vehicle of the self-overcoming of environmental crises. Uh, now, we need not be cynical, uh, uh, but merely observant uh, to note that expansive concerns and sympathies are not the inevitable or even the most likely response to a recognition of interdependence, porosity, and vulnerability. Quite the contrary, an awareness of openness and exposure to transformation is readily harnessed to what Roberto Esposito has titled the immunitary logic of biopolitical security and a corresponding militarization of the environment. That's Robert uh, Marzak's term. To use Deleuze and Guattari's terms were cited earlier, uh, the deterritorializing image of post or transhuman or posthuman philosophy can be re-territorialized in commercial and political power struggles. Along these lines, Michael Mukalik finds that in the same way that Darwin, Darwinian ideas became used to justify fascist and nationalist forms of power, Rhizomatic theory is amenable to reconfigurations of bios within biotechnological discourses of life. The lesson here is not that a fatalistic or nihilistic posthumanism is more historically apt than a wishful posthumanism. Rather, it's that the relationship among posthuman philosophical ideas, ethical dispositions, and political practices associated with eco ecological politics are neither logically nor historically inevitable or necessary, but rather contingent on a set of evolving discursive as social and ecological entanglements. And what I explore a little bit in some of this paper, and I won't be able to get through all of it, are some of these entanglements in connection with images of interactions between human beings and trees in several texts uh, posthumanist philosophies address. Trees figure more or less prominently in the works of nearly all posthumanist philosophies. They stand variously for individuation, for rhizomatic ecological relationships, for the interdependence of material beings, or in some cases for its autonomy. Uh, Deleuze and Guattari, for instance, are very well known for figuring networked processes and discrete beings in botanical terms as rhizomes and trees, respectively. However, it would be a mistake to take uh, their figures literally. Trees are also what they call machines that interact with and transform others, fungi, bacteria, deer, sunlight, beetles, and play a part in human processes, not least those of respiration. As the rather fortuitously named David Wood succinctly puts it, quote, if Deleuze and Guattari are right about trees, then trees are not trees, unquote. A formulation they no doubt would have enjoyed. Uh, nonetheless, given their uh, metaphorical bias, it is somewhat surprising to find that in the very first volume of Capitalism and Schizophrenia, their first example of schizophrenic experience, with, that is, experience of nature as a process of production, 
uh, involves the coupling of man and tree, a figure they take uh, from the novella Lens by Georg Buchner in 1836. I have a discussion of that. I'm going to have to set it aside here. Regardless, apart from a few passing metaphors, they said little about past or present conjunctures of trees and human beings. How might the perspective they adopt then be brought uh, to bear on such conjunctures? Consider a recent book by David George Haskell titled The Songs of Trees which introduces readers to a series of multi-species ecologies in which human beings and trees are co-participants, one tree species at a time in each chapter. Uh, like Deleuze and Guattari, Haskell asserts the priority of relations over individual beings, re revealing interlaced ramifications of trees, insects, bacteria, fungi, and historical human communities. Uh, as his title promises, Haskell's uh, prose is riddled with extravagant anthropomorphisms. Not only do trees sing, they also have mouths, blood, etc. But as he emphasizes, the songs he describes are also literal, comprised of sonic vibrations emanating from trunks, roots, leaves, and the chorus, as he calls it, they form with other beings. Rain on leaves, the rumble of soil displaced by roots, fungal conspirators, vibrations of woodpeckers in the bodies of insects, etc. He tunes into these songs by means of electronic instruments that amplify and translate subtle vibrations into the register of human audition. And he join, then joins the chorus, placing his readers into contact uh, with multi-species ecologies that he listens to and translating their amplified songs into lyrical prose. Now, as Haskell emphasizes, it's impossible to disentangle the literal and metaphorical dimensions of influence and in listening. Yet even as he eloquently ventriloquizes for his readers, he laments that, quote, knowledge gained through extended bodily relationship with the forest is more robust than ideas and statutes that live only in disembodied intellect, unquote. Carried away by the music, Haskell forgets that dichotomies between embodied and intellectual knowing are unsustainable on his own terms. Uh, regarding another poet in the woods, uh, in his lecture on symbol, Alfred North Whitehead reminds us that, quote, both the word and the trees themselves enter into our experience on equal terms. Thus, for the poet in his ecstasy, or perhaps agony, of composition, the trees are the symbols and the words are the meaning. For us, the words are symbols which enable us to capture the rapture of the poet in the forest. Uh, now, this applies also to the images here on screen, which are not trees, uh, but again, images. However, they also enter our experience, as Whitehead puts it, on equal terms. Uh, Whitehead describes the reciprocal correlation between trees and words in his example of Sylvan poetry as, quote, the most fundamental exemplification of symbolism, unquote. Uh, for him, all symbol symbolism correlates experiences which he attributes to both human and non-human beings, tying sounds to images, smells, what have you, and vice versa. Uh, as he explains, a language elicits not only cognitive meaning, but also, quote, enveloping suggestiveness and emotional efficacy, unquote. Hence, quote, it is a mistake to think of words primarily as the vehicle of thoughts, unquote. Now my question is, might trees also work this way uh, as agents of post-humanist perspectives? Whitehead uh, himself suggested that, quote, certain aesthetic experiences which are easy pr to produce make better symbols than do words, unquote. So why not trees? The question has been asked in earnest. I'm not the first. Pierce Stevens, for, zest, for instance, suggests that the vitality of encounters with nature, or nature experiences, as he calls them, depend upon the extent to which they grant possibilities of, quote, new perception through non-instrumentalized immediate experience, unquote. The tenor of such experiences, however, vary dramatically, ranging, as Whitehead puts it, from ecstasy to agony, or as he suggests in other places, terror. Uh, Anyone who spent a night alone, cold, in unfamiliar woods knows uh, that material entanglement, if I may say so this way, is not always delightful. Uh, not only uh, uh, is this the case uh, for nature experiences, but as Whitehead says, for all meanings. He quote, meanings are often shifting and indeterminate, and this happens even in the case of words. Shocking. Uh, the same can be said for trees. Their aesthetic and their ethical political value will vary along with the territories, very broadly understood, in which they are encountered. 
But while trees have no intrinsic aesthetic value, they can nonetheless be vital components of landscapes of concern, indifference, care, terror, responsibility, etc. In his study of slow violence, for instance, Rob Nixon describes several intersecting dimensions along which trees contribute to human environmental politics. As he notes, the Green Belt Movement formed by the Wangarai Matai, uh, by Wangarai Matai to combat deforestation and forced dislocations in Kenya, one of his privileged examples of the environmentalism of the poor, illuminated the reverberation of tree ecosystems in social and military conflicts. And in the movement, he argues, trees served a theatrical as well as a strategic function, playing a part in what he calls aesthetic activism. He writes, tree planting served not only as a practical response to an attritional environmental calamity, but in addition, a symbolic hub for political resistance and for media coverage of an otherwise amorphous issue. Again, shifting it in determinate meanings here, given shape uh, precisely by tree planting. In the Greenbelt movement, he describes, trees comprise a kind of slow anti-violence, thematizing the transgenerational temporality of sustainable ecologies. And as this case shows, trees not only play a crucial role as connectors and symbols of ecological interdependencies, but they also shape human temporal perspectives. Indeed, they've often played a central role in marking the durations as well as the territorial locations of transgenerational human societies, as well as, of course, uh, having a significant place to play in, in many uh, human cosmologies. The tree of life, for instance, appears in many different cultural contexts. Uh, it was also the name of a synagogue recently attacked in an act of anti-Semitic violence in the United States. Now, I'm almost done here. More speculatively, it might be argued that the temporal perspective proper to trees is well suited to the ethical and political imaginaries of post-humanist thinkers. Deleuze and Guattari, for instance, argued that terrified and hostile reactions to transversal relationships can be or even should be ameliorated by retaining what they call small plots, a phrase that indicates both spatial and temporal stabilities. Understood along both axes, trees might serve as mediators of sorts between the turbulence of contemporary social and ecological processes and the geological perspective implied by the term the Anthropocene, which situates human history in long durations or cycles of climactic change. And in this respect, the focus instead on tree temporality may provide a welcome, in, uh, sorry, the latter, the Anthropocene temporality, may provide a welcome estrangement from instrumental pressures, but it also serves what Nietzsche called an extra moral cosmic perspective, more conducive to nihilism than to care and responsibility for the ephemeral lives of little animals in the far off corner of the universe. I can't elaborate on these speculations here, but only note uh, that none of this is inevitable uh, or even likely. Uh, and that the ethical or political function of post-humanist philosophies, again, will depend on their creative deployment in changing social and ecological circumstances. As we explore their possibilities, we will be well served by the lessons of the canon of the humanities, which can be distinguished from that of the sciences, not by the aim of discovering the essence and purposes of the human, with all its attendant exclusions and hierarchies, but rather by self-conscious attention to the rhetorical, stylistic, and figural dimensions of language through which ideas are communicated and gain purchase in sensibilities and practices. Thank you. Thank you for a most inspiring presentation and for reminding us that trees aren't bad. Um, I, I was much struck by your comment that um, the notion of the rhizome in Deleuze and Guattari shouldn't be taken too literally. God, it often is. As if uh, it was some kind of gardening manual. Um, the whole point was to dismiss the metaphorical privilege, the normative privilege given to the idea of the tree, dating back to Aristotle, by reminding everyone that there's nothing special about trees within um, the vegetal um, realm. Unfortunately, I think Deleuze and Guattari themselves got a bit carried away sometimes, as if there was something special about the rhizome, which is simply one alternative mode of plant organization. Many plants are neither rhizomes nor trees. And that's absolutely fine too. The whole point, and I th going back, I think, to uh, Rosie's keynote, is that modes of material organization are simply what they are. They don't give us a message or a mandate. 
to structure either our thought or our reality in order to align with them. And speaking as, as an amateur gardener myself, many rhizomes are weeds. Rhizomes are part of the problem in making nature into a garden, which itself is a project that can be criticized, of course, because it's imposing something outside the self-organization on the self-organization. But at the same time, particularly perhaps in the tradition of Asian gardening, Korean, Japanese, Chinese, um, using the internal logic of self-organization to bring out something implicit within it, but not spontaneously expressed by it. And in that regard, getting rid of the rhizomes, because they are weeds, is one crucial aspect of uh, making the garden into a garden. Are we to say that there's something illegitimate about the very project of gardening? I'm not sure that's what Deleuze and Guattari meant, and I'm not sure even if they meant it, that it's something that legitimately can be uh, extracted from their theoretical concept. So perhaps we need, among other things, and thank you for opening that particular uh, theme or line of thought, perhaps we need, among other things, in our discussion later, to be talking precisely about gardening. Our third speaker, and I mean that very seriously, literally, if you will, gardening, as project, process, activity, and mode of uh, understanding and self-understanding. Our third speaker, and last speaker, in this panel uh, is Yvonne Furster, who is a research fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Cultural Sciences at the University of Konstanz in Germany, and also affiliated uh, with Leo Fana University Lüneburg. And she will be addressing us on emergent technologies and post-human embodiment. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I think my, my presentation will match very well with what we heard before because um, I'm coming from philosophy, so my, uh, my main focus is phenomenology. I'm doing Merleau-Ponty, the French philosopher, and it's, his philosophy is all about non-dualistic thinking, about being entangled with the things, about becoming in the world. That means um, the subject and the object as the big categories, he doesn't think they are a given. They are not there yet. So when something comes into the world, be it an organism, be it a plant, be it a human being, it becomes with this type of contact. So I'm all in for these descriptions you've given. So being entangled or being a rhizomatic being, um, I'm all in for this, but I will, uh, I wanna share an observation with you this morning, um, which I find haunting as a phenomenologist. Um, if we look at the movies, and the movies are in our culture quite important. Um, there's a German philosopher and a film theorist, Joseph Früchte. He says that the movies are kind of semi-grand narratives. So if you remember Francois Lyotard who said, um, the grand narratives, they have died, they are not there anymore. They don't give us, uh, Christianity for example, they don't give us this orientation anymore. So um, the movies are kind of taking this place. It's not one movie that will give us the narrative of our life, of our future society, but it's the, the topics in the movies, the images we find that kind of constitute a cultural atmosphere. In a sense, that's why I take the movie so seriously. And now we have um, a very weird um, situation that in philosophy, in media philosophy, um, and also in post-human theory, we speak of this um, dissolution of the subject, a subject that has been really problematic, the subject of the Anthropocene, um, the strong subject, um, the closed subject, is criticized and it's losing its boundaries in a positive sense. So we're making theories that rely on this um, relationship with the outer world. While um, there is a kind of different talk in technology where we all are very um, uh, optimistic in the sense that our bodies will be enhanced, that we will uh, perfect our lives and we will be the active creators of our future. Um, and this, this is the setup, the cultural setup uh, in which the movies arise. And the movies 
show us a whole different image. They show us suffering bodies. They, they show us tortured bodies, punished bodies. The body comes back like a zombie, it haunts us. And this is the setup I want to try to understand, um, which is for me um, an important thing to see why the body comes back with all its force in such a negative way while we are constructing um, these interesting futures intellectually. So let me give you some examples. Um, I will try to, to make clear what I mean with the topic of the fourth revolution. The fourth revolution fundamentally differs from the industrial revolution when it comes to embodiment or bodily engagement with machines. You all know the scene from Charlie Chaplin's movie Modern Times from 1936 um, in which he is toiling at the fret mill and whose rhythm possesses his body. Maybe we can see a little image of that. Oh, I have to go forward. Uh, how about just wait a minute. Double on bench five. Check on the nut tightening. Nut coming through loose on bench five. Attention foreman. What is happening, he is standing at the fret mill and the fret mill is going quicker and quicker and when he goes off the fret mill, he goes like this. So he will still have that rhythm possessing his body um, which was uh, like introduced to his body through this type of work. Uh, and then we had the digital revolution and that didn't change so much with the introduction of the computer screens and the mobile phones the body was oriented in a central perspective style toward these devices. Though in a less painful way, with the new technologies, another regime of movement or stasis was introduced. Humans became less integrated within the large assemblies of machines that we've seen in the, in the Industrial Revolution. Instead, work has become more and more a static thing. The white collar worker sitting all day in front of a personal computer became the paradigm of work at, le at least in the Western world. So um, images like this one, it's still pretty modern, so we still have the fret mill, and the other kind of fret mill is sitting in front of a screen. And uh, this type of uh, bodily orientation is a very old one, since it dates back to the central perspective. So the invention of the central perspective essentially shapes the technology we have now. So all the time we look at our beloved phones, um, we're reincarnating the central perspective, which is essentially also a dualistic perspective. We have an object and a subject, and both are oriented toward each other. Let me share one more, um, oh, sorry. With the fourth revolution, the role of the worker and her body changes. The fourth revolution promises to free the body from inhumane labor and repetitive tasks such as analyzing endless lists of data and documents. Artificial intelligence is about to take over analytic tasks and robots will do the toiling. It is for humans now time to recover our creative abilities. The gift of empathy and vision to build a better future of humans will um, be decisive uh, for the next, say, 10 or 20 years. We all know that the story is too good to be true. Every revolution comes with frictions and mostly painful processes of reconstructing, re restructuring work and society. Let me share one observation. There's an interesting ambivalence with the contemporary discourse when it comes to the body. On the one hand side, a great future gets depicted where human bodies are freed from inhumane working conditions. Heavy bodily labor as well as annoying repetitive cognitive tasks will be done by automated processes and artificial intelligences. The vision is extended into a future where the human mind will even be free from the body, roaming a virtual paradise where the indulgence of chocolate cakes has no harmful consequences. The current visions of future life worlds tend to imagine distributed artificial intelligences as the ultimate goal. And the vision has a flip side. This is the finite embodied human being. 
just a note on, on the virtual futures and on the mind upload. I've been discussing with uh, leaders from several techno, um, tech firms um, this idea and they are really um, passionate about the idea of mind upload and they imagine really themselves if, if it was a real possibility. It has one side, we could live in a more sustainable way. We wouldn't take up all the resources if we were um, uploaded minds, if we were virtual beings. But still this vision comes with a strong sense of uh, bodily pleasures, which I find weird because we don't have any concept how we could exist within a virtual space and still enjoy the bodily pleasures. But th this is uh, a, miracle, uh, a riddle that is still to be solved. So Here we get to the other side of the current discourse on human-machine relations, the prevalence of the dystopian narratives. If one takes a closer look at science fiction movies, we see these tortured, punished, and suffering bodies. The soft version of this dystopian narrative presents human being as an outdated species. Um, if you remember Spike Jones is her. Um, this movie uh, is, is about um, falling in love with uh, uh, operating systems in a computer that seem very human-like because their voice is so uh, human-like and they're so intelligent and they have empathy and so on. And, uh, but in the end, um, they kind of unite in another dimension and then uh, the human get left behind and they're just outdated, outdated versions. Same thing um, goes for Transcendence. Transcendence, a movie from 2014 by Wally Pfister made. Um, this imagines also uh, an uploaded mind that becomes uh, general intelligence and in the end um, this general intelligence uh, becomes kind of evil or is perceived as a danger to humanity. So the only thing is to switch off all technology. Um, that leads to the disappearance of that kind of um, distributed intelligence. Um, but we'll see in the end of the movie a tiny scene that this uh, intelligence has not disappeared. It has become elementary. It has become the air and the elements um, of, of, what life, uh, what, of what life is made up. And uh, again, humanity stays behind without any technology going back basically to the Middle Ages um, in lifestyle. So this is the, the, the softer version. And the other version, you know, see some images uh, later, um, is the mind upload as a type of uh, extreme suffering. Um, we see that uh, mainly in Black Mirror. Black Mirror has many, the, the, the US series has many, um, movies in, in the series where uh, the mind upload is an extreme suffering because the consciousness that formerly had been an embodied consciousness is suddenly without the body. So um, these this are the, the, the big topics we find in the movies. My working hip hypothesis is that we lack images and theories that develop a positive notion of post-human forms of embodiment. And I think we need such constructive notions in order to develop a viable ethics for what is coming. So in the following, I will give a short overview of theories um, that structurally tend to be oblivious of embodied experience and cognition. Um, for example, neuroscience. Um, in neuroscience, human cognition has been viewed as information processing in, anal in analogy to computers. The computer model of the mind has lost its fascination today. But the idea that it's all in your head is ubiquitous. The gray matter has been identified as Descartes' race cogitans. The mind has become materialized in a complex net of synapses whose activity starts prior to conscious experience. The fact that this brain is embedded in an organism and the organism embedded and entangled in an environment and able to extend its cognition through diverse media is not central to neuroscientific research. The oblivion of the body is taken one step further with technology. Um, the human machine interface already exists in form of pacemakers, VR classes or implants that prevent epileptic, epileptic seizures. The future vision is to build interfaces that enhance cognition and connect brains within larger human machine networks. That would mean manipulating cognition in, on a pre-conscious level. This is also not as new as it sounds. It's long-standing topos of media theory and media philosophy that technology is constitutive 
of the way we think, act, and hence create cultures. Digital technology takes this to a whole new level because it operates on temporal micro scales. And this exerts an influence beyond any form of experience. And here come um, theories in media philosophy um, that I find very um, interesting in terms of, a, in, in a metaphysic uh, sense. So if we look at, uh, for example, Catherine Hale's idea of the technogenesis of the human mind, where she describes how technological processes um, reconfigurate how we think and act before we know it. Um, similar to this is Bernard Stiegler's epiphylogenesis. It's a cultural evolution with means that are not human. So essentially we are developing um, our cognitive uh, setup through a technology that we created, but that in turn creates us because it works on temporal micro scales that we cannot, we cannot perceive this influence. I mean, we also did not perceive how um, maybe uh, the printing, um, the uh, printing and, and writing um, might have uh, altered our cognition. But uh, at this point, um, the description we get from philosophy side um, are turning um, the human cognition into something very passive. So we are formed and informed by the technology uh, and we have no access to this process. As, uh, also, uh, we don't have access to how our neural setup um, creates our consciousness. So these two forms are very um, constructing a passive uh, subject. And uh, if one takes a bird's eye perspective on these different discourses, be it uh, neuroscience or media philosophy or philosophy of ecology, even where the human agency is equal to technology agency, there is one common factor. Human life is depicted as either coming too late or being rather passively caught up. And the, the, the contrast against this is, uh, is the transhumanist discourse on us uh, and also from technology on us creating, actively designing a future and becoming the better of ourselves. And this creates a very, very active subject that sounds pretty much like the subject from the Anthropocene. So we have a kind of a schizophrenic thing going on that in philosophy and in many cultural theories, we depict ourselves as being more immersed, more entangled, a bit more passive. While on the other hand side, we have a discourse that depicts us as extremely active, super strong subjects that will create the future. And I think this is the tension um, that creates uh, these images that we see in the movies. I wanted to show some more examples, but I think I'm running out of time. Good. You have, yeah, you have three minutes. Three minutes, okay. So I might spare you the horrible uh, scenes we see, but um, it is precisely what happens that um, it seems that our bodies are a symptom of this kind of schizophrenic dilemma we are in. So uh, we have two grand narratives of, um, of what our conditio humana at the moment is. One is this passive thing of being um, a part in a larger um, ecology and we need to do something for the better of this ecology because previously we have constructed ourselves as we can um, influence every type of process and now we know no nonlinear processes are not really understandable for human beings so we have to conceive of ourselves as a part in a larger whole and on the other side um, the, the tech firms who construct every kind of um, uh, say technological environment as something that leads to a bright future and that leads to perfecting the human beings. And within this tension, I think uh, the humanities are called uh, to action to, to find um, notions of human life that are more constructive. And what I would say, um, not reintroducing the strong subject, but um, we need to introduce a concept of experience, which is vital to um, understanding how human beings and how the whole life world is changing and can be formed in new and constructive and also sustainable ways. So um, coming from this horrible um, images we see in the movies, um, my plea 
for uh, the, the task of humanities is take also a phenomenological stance, try to introduce an experience, an active experience with technology in which we can experience ourselves as a part of this larger setup and actively um, work with ethic norms and not only conceive of ourselves as a passive thing or the perfect subject that will lead to the perfect future. Thank you.